Well, thank you very much for having me, um, and good afternoon. I've worked in sport, I've worked in health, I've worked in business. Um, this is one of my offices, worked there for about the last 20 odd years, um, but I have worked in uh, public sector health, private health, and as I say, the corporate sector too. It's interesting, whichever sector I'm working in, there is a common theme, a common goal. It's helping people, or indeed organisations, to achieve their goal. As a physiotherapist working with patients, we're challenged to try and deliver health, function, quality of life. That's the patient's goal as well. In sport, it's about winning or doing your personal best. And in business, if we've been totally frank, it's about productivity and profit. And let's not forget that. One word combines the approach with all three, though. It's resilience. There's no point in getting a patient better for one day. That's not a great health outcome. There's no point in getting a team to win one match a year. That's not a great performance outcome. And there's no point in teaching businesses how to be productive and profitable for one week. Most aim for 52. So resilience, it's been fascinating listening how this word has cropped up and cropped up today, is key in pretty much whichever sector I've worked in. So as an overview, I'm going to try and talk about stress and fatigue, a little bit on exercise, and try and link those together in performance in 15 minutes flat. I am going to involve you too, and we're going to involve you right now. I, I'm, I'm not very good with technology, so apologies for not doing telephone phone-ins. We'll, we'll stick with hands if that's all right. It can be your physical activity of the day. Okay, we'll do that. So, question one. Who here is interested in health and happiness? Great. That's good. Who here is interested in performing well at work? Great. We're on the right page. This is looking good. This is looking good. Okay. Um, just, just one last question, if I, if I may. Who here has been stressed today? <laughs> Definitely. I spilt coffee on my shirt at King's Cross. It wasn't good. It's, oh, it's dreadful. Keep your hand up. Sorry. No, it's in, that's good. Who's been stressed this week? We're getting there, aren't we? This month? <laughs> this year? Hands down. Did anyone not put their hand up? I want your job. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's not bad. That's... Sorry? There we go. <laughs> this is why I haven't got your job. I'm there. I'm there. So we're in the right space. You are all part of a 21st century epidemic that stress is, and we could quote all sorts of statistics. You know, over half a million people in the UK reported some form of work-related stress, and 13.8 million working days lost as a result of work-related stress. 12 million people see their GPs each year with mental health problems, stress often identified as the root cause. So, so we're all being exposed to this potentially lethal epidemic of stress. And it's lethal because it caused a number of health issues. Poor lifestyle and stress is certainly related to a, a number of conditions. Um, chronic heart disease, stroke, risks of cancer, vascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes. And it, it, this could have been a bit like the opening credits from Dad's Army, you know, when those arrows go all over the place. Because it, it's very rare that you get singular, singular pathologies. You know, many of these people suffer comorbidities. And exposing themselves to future health risk. Their financial implications. Um, this is what, I, I put this in deliberately because those of you who are really paying attention will go, well, surely on the slide before it was not 45 million working days, it was something else. And I think this is a classic example of why our messaging needs to be very much more consistent and coherent and tight. As Tricia Goddard said at the beginning of the day, we default to cynicism as a nation in comparison to our experience on the other side of the Atlantic. Well, I can understand being, people being cynical if we're being confused by different messaging. Um, they're also hidden costs, aren't they? Do you know the average cost of recruitment is over £8,000? A few of you work in HR, so you probably did know that. But uh, 
quite surprising. But if there's an average staff turnover in the UK of just over 18% and a working population of around about 29 million people, those sorts of numbers really do start to add up. And of course, there's social implications as well. Being sick certainly is a, a threat to, I would say, your own personal confidence and well-being and that of your family and indeed your position in your local infrastructure and community. It changes our behaviours when we're fatigued and stressed, and that may well then change our relationships. It is a bit of a spiral, downward spiral towards a black hole if it's not addressed. So anyway, when if I'm doing a workshop, you've all said you're stressed, which is great. I would normally ask you now, what is stress? At which point most people sort of sit and scratch their heads and maybe shuffle around uncomfortably and think, please don't ask me. Please don't. And if I'm nice, I just get to write it down. And you get these great long paragraphs about psychological, physiological, emotional um, response, positive, negative, all of these things. So I'm going to tell you what stress is in four words. And my parents would absolutely wet themselves if they thought that I was talking about physics at Cambridge University. But here we go. <laughs> stress is a response to load. That's what the dictionary says. And it's a physical definition. Can you remember doing that little experiment at school? Oh yeah. It's not normally a wire. It's normally a spring, OK? A, you know, a spring. And, and you put weights on it, and the spring either doesn't move, or it stretches a bit, or it breaks. Well, I would suggest that human beings are similar. Not the same as a spring or what, but similar. And human beings either stay stable, or they stretch, or they break. And the break can either be in performance or it could be in health. The difference is, of course, with human beings, there are many different loads. We don't often stick metal weights on parts of our body. I, I think I saw something on the internet once, but um, <laughs> there, there are all sorts of different types of load, from pathological, toxic cigarettes, alcohol, the environment, emotional, work, mental. They're just sort of seven pillars that I put, but there'll be plenty, plenty more. One of the issues with stress is we are very inconsistent with our definitions and our descriptions, and it becomes confusing. We're equally fairly inconsistent with our understanding of loads, and we're inconsistent because we are all different. I think that if the nation doesn't know that drinking lots of alcohol, not eating any fruit and veg, and not exercising isn't good for its health by now, it probably isn't going to take that message on board. The generic information has been of great use and has achieved things in a whole host of areas, but has not broken the camel's back. We use a technology where we look at personalisation. We use little monitors that we stick on people. We have very small little things, about the size of a matchbox. And we show people what is going on physiologically in their stress response. In 15 minutes, I can't sort of go into much detail, but I'm just going to show you an example. This is a city trader. This is him on a Monday, 24 hours. This is him on a Tuesday. You will see three colours. Dark blue is when he's physically loaded. He went to the gym there. Brown is when he is non-physically loaded, a state of sympathetic dominance, adrenaline, cortisol. I'm definitely brown at the moment. He went to bed just before midnight, and he's gone straight into, and rather appropriately, a Cambridge blue colour that indicates parasympathetic dominance, a state when our bodies are recovering and recuperating and recharging. He's gone to bed just there. He's gone straight into recovery. Do I think he's ready to perform at work the next day? Yeah, I think he probably is. Looks pretty good to me. The very next day, no recovery till 5.30 in the morning. Interestingly, he was asleep at exactly the same time. So though his sleep time is good, his quality of sleep and recharge is poor. Okay? The difference here is he took clients out for dinner, two-thirds of a bottle of wine and ate late. So a couple of behaviours that are not good at, in, at uh, triggering recovery. But we'll see exactly the same with people who play on their Xbox until two minutes before they go to bed, fall asleep with their television on, or worried about a board meeting tomorrow, tomorrow, or even a presentation, or getting up in the early, or struggling to sleep because the environment's maybe... You sleep in a hotel and it's maybe a degree hotter than normal? And you toss and turn and toss and turn, and then at 3 o'clock in the morning you decide to turn the temperature down. You know, in sport, we teach people to try and turn it down beforehand. 
We didn't do very well with the England rugby team, so I don't think they got to their bedrooms before three o'clock in the morning. But, um, from this, we can actually show people where they're resilient. On day one, the batteries drain during the day. Totally normal. But recharge and recovery was sufficient to get to positive territory. On day two, the batteries drain during the day. But recovery was poor. If this is consistent as a physiological status, you will not stay healthy and you will not perform well. We use this data to hopefully motivate people and teach them about behaviours that can influence performance. If load is excessive, performance goes down. Excellent. We've done stress. Nearly there. Exercise. This is a great statement. Um, Professor Liam Donaldson, the, the then Chief Medical Officer, being physically active is crucial to good health. If a medication existed and had a similar effect on preventing disease, it would be hailed as a miracle cure. I think we all agree that exercise in general is good for people's well-being and health, and that's physical and mental. I'd also say it's not just about preventing, it's also about managing disease as well. Um, and we've known it for an awful long time. Plato in 300 BC was ranting on about it even. And uh, more recently, I'm, I do like this study, so I often put it in. Jerry Morris in 1947, who's an epidemiologist, looked at people who worked on these things, the London buses. Now, this is quite an interesting study because on the London bus, you've got two people. You've got someone who sits on their backside at the front, and you've got someone who walks around the rest of the day. These two guys work the same shift in the same environment and come from the social demographic. These ones have a 50% increased chance of heart disease. Interesting study. And it's not just a problem in the UK. This is looking at China and how changes in transport, mode of transport to work, um, correlates in with increase in lifestyle diseases. And you can see a drop in usage of bicycle, um, public transport, an increase in car, works, or bus, and how obesity and cardiovascular disease has increased. I could go on about exercise for ages. I want to just show you a video that's been part of the NHS 2012 challenge. Great. I mean, I think you can see how the NHS has been inspired by sport in the Olympics, and I'm sure many of your organisations will get excited next year. The cost of that programme, which in the heart of England that was cited there, was um, £1.25 for a five-month programme for 500, as 400 people. Those are the sorts of figures you need to go in and talk to your finance directors about. Okay, in summary, I'm just going to bring this all together. Um, I've tried to just bring together links between sport, health and work and how understanding stress and recovery, i.e. coping, is key to delivering resilience and indeed sustained performance. Exercise gives us physical energy. There are other energies, mental energy and emotional energy that are equally important. Many companies have good policies that are bought into by their finance directors about sustainable energy. I would suggest that we include the word people in that sentence and we look at sustainable people energy or sustainable human energy. We talked about a balancing act. Many organisations look at load. I would encourage you to look at increasing coping. And it's been very interesting listening to some of the speakers today, and those have been ex the exact strategies that they've really looked at. You can measure it. We can move away from some of the wishy-washy, stressy, fluffy bits and pieces, and you can measure it. And it's worth measuring it. We did a study with 100 people in a FTSE 100 company. Um, we looked at performance, and we looked at a number of health markers. The strongest relationship with performance, which was measured as success in achieving KPIs set out in their appraisal, were those who got back to positive territory. We need to start talking in positive language. Let's start talking about improvements in productivity. 23 extra working days, acts of PPP would suggest. And look at the financial implications of the NHS, an organisation with 1.2 million workers. Uh, that fluctuates a bit, I know, but I had to pick a number somewhere. An average wage of about £150 per day, 23 extra working days per year, equates to £4.1 billion. Not a bad number, is it? So key message number one, it doesn't just happen. Approaches need to be sustainable. 
I tried to learn the piano a few years ago, and do you know what? I didn't go in, have one lesson, be given a bit of music, told to put my fingers here, and three months later was able to play the Moonlight Sonata. I had to go back and have another lesson. <laughs> Approaches need to be sustainable and messages need to be repeated. They equally need to be repeated in different ways. I've touched on exercise and sleep, two factors that I look around, seven pillars of performance. But the more hooks you chuck out, the more fish you'll catch. The last thing, leadership. Um, I asked you at the beginning who was interested in health and happiness and who was interested in work. I'd like to rephrase that now. You don't have to stick your hands up. This is something for you to reflect on. I'd like to ask you who's committed to it, who's committed to health and happiness, and who's committed to performing well at work. Because if you're interested, well, this morning will have been nice. You'd have had a nice cup of tea, a biscuit, met some new friends, listened to some interesting talks. It would have been nice. But if you're committed, I hope this morning's been very meaningful. And you go away from here thinking how you can make a difference, number one, to yourself, number two, to your family, number three, to your community, and number four, to your organisation. I think attitudes are contagious. For those of you who are committed, I hope yours is infectious and virulent. Thank you.